In a second, you're going to see a, a, a video. We have a missionary with us, uh, Steve Puffpaff, uh, and he's going to be sharing this morning. But last, the last couple of weeks, we were talking about how you can be the MVP for somebody else, and you can help them out. And sometimes you don't know how far your ripple can truly go. You've been ministered to by Steve Puffpath without even knowing that you've been ministered to by Steve Puffpath. Because my first missions trip uh, to the city of refuge back in, I believe it was 2004, I got called to the mission field, uh, not the mission field, but to the uh, to ministry on the mission field. And it was a moment where we were praying for the kids of the city of refuge, and then the kids started praying for us. And I just remember distinctly, it's, these kids were praying, let this man be a preacher so he can tell other kids and uh, teenagers about Jesus. And I remember saying, but God, I want an adult to tell me this. And so we had a, a Wednesday night service, and one of the house parents, Marvin, he uh, preached a sermon that I can't remember what everything he said, but it was like he was reading my, my journal and knew everything, and I knew that God was calling me into ministry that night. And I, I know, Steve, that's not why you guys went to Jamaica uh, to uh, impact Americans. You went to impact Jamaicans, but through the process, you, you, your ministry called me into ministry. And so this morning, as you watch this video, you're going to see uh, what, what they're up to now in, in Suriname um, on the, the northern coast of South Africa, and not South Africa, South America. I'm getting all my words messed up today. But um, you'll be able to watch and see what God is doing through the Puff Pass, and then Steve is going to come up and share this morning. favorite things I get to do in mentoring these leaders is to come alongside some of our students as they plant churches in unreached people groups. One of my students, Sherry Ann Griffin, is involved in reaching a people group called the Saramakan. Their ancestors were Africans brought to the New World to work on the plantation as slave labor. But many of them escaped and went into the jungle and began living just like they lived in Africa. Today, some 300 years later, they have villages where they're animus and their society is built on divination. Sherry Ann has gone back and is reaching one of these unreached people group. I've been able to go back there with her and see firsthand how lives are being transformed. Another one of our pastors, Helen Orange, is reaching a people group called the Okan. Again, I've had the privilege of going to the villages where she's working, Libi Dote and Baku, and see people coming to know the Lord. So we covet your prayers and your help. Would you help us to continue our work in raising up leaders and reaching unreached people groups in the Caribbean region. Will you pray for us as churches are being established, places where the gospel has never been preached before. Thank you for the warm welcome this morning. I wish my wife could be with me today, but she's preaching in Florida. So who got the better deal, huh? <laughs> Just kidding. It's warm here on the inside, isn't it? But you know, wow, that that is a, such a humbling report you sent, and uh, 
you know, and that happened a lot, you know, and, and so we, we just thank God for that. And the guy, Marvin, that you talked about, he particularly was used that way on a number of people. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know uh, <clears throat> Pastor Payne in Union City, but uh, his youth pastor, Marvin, prophesied that he would marry this other girl on the team. They weren't even dating, so that sort of caused an alarm on the team, but <laughs> today they're married and serving the Lord as youth pastors, so that, that kind of thing happened. But, um, you know, I, as I just look over you today, and some of you have said, good to see you again, it's been a long time, and, you know, I mean, you have supported me since I've been missionaries, 31 years, so thank you so much, because really what I share, you've had a part in all along, and if any of you are older than 30 years, when we pioneered a church on the east side of Detroit, you helped me, so that's, we've been, we've had a relationship a long time, so thank you, thank you for the church's support. And uh, again, Pastor, you know, we're, I'm surrounded all around. This church brought teams to the City of Refuge. You came on a team from Northville, so thank you. Um, I'm just sharing today that, you know, our time at the City of Refuge and doing that was one of the highlights of our life to see what God did there. Um, and today, those little kids are graduating, and, uh, you know, our vision was always transformation of their lives. Now, I can't say they're all doing really great, but uh, a lot of them are, are excelling. Da I don't know if you remember some of these names, like David. Is, uh, we have one, uh, one of our graduates is uh, accepted into law school. How I many think that's pretty neat for a homeless kid who couldn't read when he came to the city of refuge? And others is a nurse, uh, a executive uh, chef, and uh, one in Bible school training for the ministry. Now I sound like a proud grandfather, don't I? But I am to see what God has done with these kids. And we continue to help the City of Refuge through a scholarship fund that helps them go to school and, because homeless children don't have anywhere to go And um, after they finish uh, the home. Um, but God has opened up this door to go to the country of Suriname, and uh, you saw a little bit about it there. It's, it's like no other place in this part of the world. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of people don't even know. First of all, how many know where Suriname is? See, that's the first thing. Nobody knows where Suriname is. It's one of, uh, as the pastor said, one of three little countries um, on the, the northeast coast of South America that don't speak Spanish. It's a, a Dutch-speaking country, but they speak many languages there, and it's very fascinating because everybody speaks at least four languages. And uh, in a conversation, they switch languages. They just switch back and forth. And uh, matter of fact, in church, like if I was in the main church today in the city of uh, Parlamibo, they would have overheads in three languages, and they would sing choruses in three languages this morning. You know, and I'm as an American going, wow, this is great. And they're going, yeah, that's how we roll, you know, just nothing to it. So, so pray for me. I, I'm, the main language is Dutch, um, the, but everybody, more people speak their Creole language called Sarantango than Dutch. So that's what I'm learning. So pray with me. It's close to Patwa, actually. Not, it's an English-based Creole language, so you can pray for me. Okay, turn with me to Jonah 3 this morning. I'm going to talk to you about God's compassion for the lost. Reading from verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king 
and his nobles. Do not any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn with fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion. It did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word. And I pray today that by your Holy Spirit, I will portray a message that comes from your heart and comes to these people. And I pray that each one of us would receive what you are saying to us today and you would work mightily in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, today is an exciting day of missions. There's more opportunities open today than ever before. But, you know, if you read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, you have to believe the coming of the Lord is coming soon. How many think so? And you, it's just like, a, you know, you see it happening just as the Bible said. So if we're going to get the job done, today is the day. Um, but interesting, in this time in Jonah, we see God's heart. You know, all through the Bible, really, there's one, one theme, and that's the mission of God. The mission of God to reach people uh, that he loves, that he died for, gave his life up, that they might receive the Lord and have eternal life. That's the mission throughout the whole Bible. And so even as you and I are here today and enjoying being Christians, um, at least half the world uh, has not even had the opportunity to hear the gospel, to make a decision. So how many think because you and I have had that right to make a decision, everybody should, let me see your hand, that everybody should have that opportunity. And that's what missions is about. So we see God's heart in this story because, um, as you know, Jonah went the other way when God said to go to Nineveh. Interesting how history seems to come back around because Nineveh that day was, first of all, capital of the Syrian Empire. It's, it's right where present-day Mosul is. And isn't that something? In the last 20 years, we've heard about Mosul and been the center of the Iraq War. And uh, they were a, had a violent army. They were conquering all the countries around them. They were very, um, you know, cruel, cut off people's heads, displayed heads on sticks going into the city, taunted their enemies to, to try to get them to surrender in fear. Do they sound like anybody we know today? They really sound like the uh, radical Islam people of today. Thank God that ISIS is being destroyed, but... It, they sound very much like the, the kind of warfare they conducted. So it's interesting because for God to say to Jonah, go to Nineveh, would be like saying to you or me, go and, and preach the gospel to ISIS. How many of you would uh, like that? How many would say, yes, Lord? <laughs> not too many takers. Normally, there's not too many who volunteer for that. But yet, that's, that's what he asked him to do. But God, even though Jonah didn't want to go, that did not change God's mind. We want to look at today the things in this story that bring out God's heart for the lost. First of all, there's a price to pay for the preaching of the gospel. Now, it's a good price. It's a good price. It's like David when he, um, when the Lord said to buy a piece of land and build an altar on it, and he went to the owner, and he he said, how much for this land? And he said, uh, king, for you, I'll give it to you. He says, no. He said, it wouldn't be a sacrifice if I don't have to pay something. So there's a cost. But, you know, salvation was free, but it cost you everything. Because the Paul says, we are bought with a price. We are not our own. So when we give our heart to Christ, we give our life to the Lord. And um, so the price for the gospel is a good price. Now, when I say price, it could be in giving. The Lord would have us, you know, give of our resources to take the gospel around the world. Giving of prayer. 
giving ourselves to prayer. Probably the greatest thing that um, we can do is all right is prayer. More, I think more is done in an hour of prayer than probably anything else you could spend an hour doing. Now, God will call us to do things that will stretch us. How many of you know that? How many of you have been stretched? Let me see your hand. Let me see it again. Just want to see the rest of you that are still going to be stretched sometime. You're not going to get by. That's just part of it. That's how we grow. That's how our faith grows. You know, if there was no challenges that you had to put into the hands of the Lord to say, God, if you don't intercede, if you don't take care of this, I'm done. So then when that happens, God has proved himself to us again. You know, Jonah wasn't willing to pay the price. I want to tell you this morning of one person that I've got to know very well that was willing to pay the price. You saw her picture. Sherry Ann Griffin, um, still on the first one, huh? There we go. All right. That one in the middle, Sherry Ann Griffin, is a young lady in her 20s. Felt God call her to the jungle of Suriname. Um, young single girl, lady. And she went there. Now, as I said, this, this area is... Uh, it's basically like going into Africa when you go there. The villages are animus. Um, they're run by, they're controlled by demons. You can move on. Next page. This is how you get there, up the river. Keep going. This is, you see this all over the villages. That, that is a temple where you can go and uh, worship demons. The demons are... Controlled. Matter of fact, Sherry Ann recently had to move out of the one village because they said, you're troubling the demons in our village. Well, that's good news and bad news. Good news is that the presence of Jesus Christ is pushing back the darkness. The bad news was she didn't have a place to live in the village. Well, it's, it's powerful. It's, you know, I can honestly say, you know, I've seen demonic powers, but nothing like, like I, I saw there. You know, even one morning walking through the village, walking, I was told this is where the lady who possesses the head demon of the village lives. And as I went through her yard, there's an orange tree, nice oranges. Fetish hanging in the tree, and someone said, if you take one of her oranges and eat it, you'll just drop dead. Well, I wasn't that hungry for orange juice anyway that day. I wasn't about to tempt it. But Sherry Ann went, and uh, God opened the door. I suppose she went when there had been a big flood, and her village was flooded out. And through Convoy of Hope, they brought in food and medical and clothes, and she began to minister. And what do you think she started with? The children. I'll tell you, you know, I'm just sold on ministry to children after living at the City of Refuge for 12 years. If someone gave me a choice, I would take the children because they're so open to the Lord, and that's where she started her church in that village. Now, she's in four villages, and three of the villages, again, they're run by demons, said, you can't put a church in our, <clears throat> in our village. But in this village, there was an old man. You can turn to that. Keep going. <coughs> there he is. He's on the, on the right, by the way. This old man, in those villages, the eldest man is basically what he says goes. There's tremendous respect for, for age. And he said to the village, listen, I believe that Jesus Christ is really the true God. And I believe that if we will let Sherry Ann build a church in our village and have a church, our village will be blessed. Praise the Lord. And the village went with it. And today, you, I think, uh, did you pass it? Just go back. Isn't that a nice building? Built right in the heart of that village. And uh, pretty soon the services are going to begin. And uh, we believe God's going to touch not only that villages, but there's 50 villages along the river. So pray with us that that revival will spread for those villages. And we're talking 
you know, serious intercession because each one of those villages is controlled by demons. So I asked Sherry Ann, she's been there now, I've gone on 15, 16 years. She's over 40 years old. I said, Sherry Ann, is the price been too great? I said, you know, maybe you'll never get married. Maybe you won't have children. She looked at me and a tear came out of her eye and she said, Pastor Steve, if I hadn't have gone, they wouldn't have heard about Jesus and they'd all be going to hell. You know, I, that has to grip us because that's really what it's all about. You know, maybe today sometimes we just walk around and unsaved people all around us and maybe get numb to the fact that if they don't know Jesus Christ, they're not going to spend eternity with Christ. That's what drove her life. The second thing in this story is you see the passion, God's passion for people that don't know him. Because even as Jonah is running, running from God, and uh, how many have found out you can't run from God? Because if you run from God, when you get where you're going, he's already there. He beats you there. And in the case of Jonah, who thought he could run from God, no, no, no deal. As he's going, you know the story of the waves get ro uh, rocky, the ship's about to crash, the men somehow on the boat determined Jonah's the one that's causing the storm, and they said to him, who are you? And he said, I'm a Hebrew. I serve the God who created the heavens and the earth, which is pretty good preaching for someone running from God. And they threw him overboard. The seas become uh, calm. And in the last part of the chapter, one says, and they made vows to the living God. Isn't that something? It shows you God's heart. Even as he's getting Jonah to turn around, he takes time to make sure the sailors hear about the living God. You know, God's passion causes us to see opportunities where other people see problems. Matter of fact, I would say that as you look around your community, that whatever problems you see, they are probably God's greatest opportunity. The, the, the issues today that your community faces are God's opportunities to prove himself mighty and to prove himself to the world that looks on the church and says, what are you doing to change people's lives? I want to tell you today about Again, some people I've got to meet that are full of God's passion. I want to talk to you, first of all, about a guy. His name is Amamil Silva, a Brazilian guy. Next slide. This is him, Amamil Silva. He and I are riding to one of the churches on, on a boat. Now, this guy, he's from Brazil. When he was 20 years old, he felt the Lord calling him to missions, and he felt this call because he had a dream, and in this dream, he saw this African lady. Somehow he knew that it was one of the ladies that lived in the jungle of Suriname, and uh, this lady said, come and help us, help my people receive the gospel. So he and his young wife packed up, went to Suriname as missionaries, and they were serving in the jungle. And uh, after a number of months there, they met this lady who was in his dream. Her name was Helen Orenge. Well, there was a couple problems. The first one was she wasn't saved. Second problem was she was a witch doctor. She was a witch doctor, and at the present time, she was involved in putting curses on over 200 people. That didn't deter him because he knew that she was the one from the dream and his wife fasted and prayed. And I don't know, if I think it was something like three months later, she got, gave her heart to Christ. God changed her life by the power of the Holy Spirit. God called her to the ministry. She was trained in Brazil in missionary school, came back and went to a village called Libidoti. And again, I just marvel at how God works. How she went there as a, as a humble servant, didn't have anywhere to stay, and, and she became a housekeeper for the administrator of a big high school there. And through that, the doors opened for her to uh, minister in the schools. 
and have her church meet in the school, and she had access to all the children and access to all the teachers because the teachers had to live there because it was in the jungle. Today she has a church of over 300, mainly children. Go ahead, keep going. There it is. How many think that looks like an exciting church service? <laughs> now here's the amazing thing. Again, the village is the second in command is a witch doctor who's tried to, told us one night in a meeting, why don't you put your church on, we'll give you land on this little island where there's no people. <laughs> why? Because he saw that the power, the stronghold of the enemy was being broken in their village, that God was working. And over half of the village had come to the Lord, and that half was most of the children in the village had come to know Jesus Christ and now are going to their church. Next slide. Let's see, here's what happens. As the children grow, if your whole church is children, then who do you disciple? Who do you train as leaders? You can answer that. I'm, all of a sudden, we're in a classroom here. The children <laughs> begin to train them. She has three different worship teams. And of course, to be on the worship team is a high honor. You have to Come to discipleship class. You have to do good in school. You have to obey your parents. You have to come to the meetings. And through that, they're being discipled. So by the time they're in high school, they're not out there are teachers. They're the worship team. They're the outreach team. Praise the Lord. I know a lot of times I go to a church and the pastor gets up and, or somebody and begging for Sunday school teachers, begging for people to help. Guess what in this church? She won't have to beg. She'll have more than she needs. And she raises up leaders in this church. Praise God. Keep going. Well, this is the land the village gave her. The village that said she's doing such a job, making such an impact on the village, gave her this piece of land. I think it's March 9th we're going to break ground. Praise the Lord. To build a church. You could give God praise. I mean, you think that's a, I mean, in Michigan, that's, that's lakeside property. That's valuable, valuable land right there. Pray with us as that building is, that we get it built. And uh, there's two other villages right near her where she's also ministering. In the second building, we've also been given land. Third one yet, we haven't, but the second one. Now, this is God, because here in the midst of people where that are witch doctors, and you see demonic activity all over, yet somehow God is opening a door, and the darkness is being pushed back. The third point is God's power. You see God's power in this story. Jonah went, uh, after some being persuaded, he went there and uh, preached a very simple message, repent or be destroyed. Not very compassionate. And to his utter amazement, God begins to work, and it says the whole city came to the Lord, right to the king. And uh, the king makes a great proclamation. He calls a fast, and he says, who knows, you know, if we'll repent of our evil ways and our violence. Isn't that amazing that God showed them, convicted him that they were violent? Can God do that today? Did God do that today in the Middle East as he brings people to the Lord? Can they be convicted of their violence? God, same to God today as there was in those days. And what happens to Jonah, Jonah who did not want to go? History tells us, it's not recorded in the Bible, that Jonah stayed for the end of his life another 40 years, and the people he did not want to go to, somehow God put a love in his heart for him. And if you go online, there's, a, there's an article that said, why did ISIS destroy Jonah's tomb? tomb? When Jonah, ISIS was still active, they destroyed Jonah's tomb. The question was, why destroy Jonah's tomb? He wasn't, they're, they're trying to destroy everything Christian. Jonah was before Christianity. But in Iraq, they look at Jonah as like the forerunner where people turned from many gods to one God, Jehovah. And then a few hundred years later, 
they turn to Jesus Christ. Friends, this is one of the essences of missions today, that if you can go and preach the word under the power of the Holy Spirit, and people can understand it, God will change people's lives. People will come to the Lord. And in this case, we're talking what Jonah did over 2,000 years ago at making an impact today. How many think that's pretty powerful? My word will not return unto me void. It will accomplish what I sent it to do. Friends, today, again, as I look at Suriname, there's no place like it in this part of the world. Not only is, you know, at least 20% of the population people that have never received the gospel that live in the jungle, but 40% of the population is Hindu and Muslim. This is, again, this isn't a picture of 200 years ago. This is a picture I took two months ago. In the capital city, there was a mosque or a Hindu temple probably every third block. Keep going. Keep going. But yet there's an openness there. Yet there's an openness with the Muslims. I'm not saying overwhelming, but I'm saying God is moving. And I'm saying that a few weeks ago when I was there and we had training for people who wanted to plant a church, we had at least eight people that said, I want to plant a church. And in the neighborhoods, there are neighborhoods of Muslims and Hindus where they're going to plant the church. And they're trusting God. And again, where, who are they starting with? The children. Already, Muslim and Hindu families will let their children come to Sunday school. And through the children, matter of fact, Helen Arange had a dream when she went to Libby Doti. And in the dream, she was catching little fish in a net. And then the Lord said to cast the net again. And she got some big fish. The Lord said to her, your church is going to be built by getting the little fish first. Then to get the big fish. Praise God. Stand with me as we close tonight. So here we are, friends. Jesus is coming back soon. There's much to be done. The doors are open like never before. And I am not embarrassed and I to say to you, who is willing to go here today? Matter of fact, who may God be speaking to? Just a while ago, you made the announcement of a young lady who was going to the Middle East. Man. Friends, I, I'll tell you, I think this generation is more committed than, than my generation to go to the hard places. And where she's going, it could cost her life, but she's going. Here, I think it's Suriname to reach Hindus and Muslims, and I need help. As you can see, if I've been a missionary over 30 years, do the math. <laughs> I'm up there. I probably have, you know, a good five years left. And I want to raise up young missionaries that I can mentor. To anybody here that maybe will say, I'll come alongside you to help you to reach Hindus, Muslims, people in the, uh, in the interior. Now, here's something that's changed. 30 years ago when I became a mission, missionary, most of the people um, in my class had been pastors. But guess what? Today that's not true. Today people come from all walks of life. Because in Muslim countries, if you said, well, I'm a pastor, they said, sorry, you're not coming in. But if you're an engineer, if you're in agriculture, if you can teach them how to uh, fish farm, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, any of those fields, guess what? The door is open for you to go in, proclaim the gospel. So if you say, well, I'm not a pastor, well, that's not an excuse anymore. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. That's okay, too, because in many cases, it's in small groups where you go in houses and you, or one-on-one -on -one, where you build relationships. And even as I told you about reaching Hindus and Muslims, it's going to come one-on-one, -on -one because they build everything on relationships. And they build everything on 
They're reaching families together. Say, well, I can do that. Well, good, you're a candidate. Let's just bow our heads as we close today. Maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. You say, Pastor, I came to the service, but I'm not a Christian. Christian. But I'd like to become one. I realize I need to commit my life to Christ. I need to change the life I'm living. Friend, today we can pray for you to receive the Lord, for your life to be changed by God. Anybody would raise their hand and say, pray for me today. Pray. How many today would say, Pastor, my life is open to God. He wants me to be a missionary. I'm willing. I'm willing. Let me see your hand today. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. I'm willing. You know, today, as we close, I just feel that if there's that, a tug on your heart to say, I'm open to become a missionary, to serve the Lord, I just want to invite you to come to the front. I want to pray for you. I don't particularly do this all the time, but I feel that this morning God is, he's talking to somebody. Anybody here, just want to come to the front and uh, we'll pray for you today that God will lead you and God will direct your steps. Anybody? Well, you can uh, come and see me at my table and pray with me. Let me just pray with the church before I turn it over to pastor. Father, today, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to minister at a church that has stood with me and been my partners for over 30 years. And so I ask you to bless them richly for their, for their support and prayers for me and my wife and others. Thank you for the impact the City of Refuge has had on, on this church. I pray they will continue to reach around the world. And even as God, a young lady, is called to missions and this church is sending her out, I pray there will be others that will sense the call and help with the harvest in these last days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.